Hello and welcome to the Grand Piano Series. Uh, my name is Mark Travis, and I see some familiar faces. I see some new faces. Uh, as a longtime friend of Rodero and Milana, it's my honor to be back in Naples for the first time since March of 2020. Why so long, Mark? Hmm. Well, I'll have you all know that my wife and I, trendsetters that we are living in New York City, we went and took care of getting COVID in March of 2020, just to get it out of the way. Uh, thankfully, uh, no serious symptoms and our kids were spared, but uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, obviously it's been a, a long two years and I can't, I'm just so happy. It's uh, nourishing to be back among friends talking about great music and having this opportunity to complete or continue a discussion that we began uh, uh, some time ago in traversing in order all 32 of Beethoven's piano sonatas. So I'm trying to keep this talk to about 30 minutes. Uh, we have six sonatas to cover, and so that leaves me with what, about five minutes per sonata, I guess? Uh, that's not enough time. So let's see, I'll just tell you that 19 and 20 are short, and now we have seven minutes per sonata to talk, right? No, uh, obviously I want to talk about uh, broader uh, concepts. I want to talk, you know, and try to put the music of Beethoven, uh, what Beethoven's going through, uh, into context, because then I think it can uh, amplify our appreciation when we listen to this music, if we have just a little bit of knowledge of what he's going through, what he might have been thinking, what the people around him might have been thinking, what else was happening in the world at that time. So tonight we'll hear, uh, we are actually halfway through, we crossed the threshold into the second half of our journey with the sonatas 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. A few of these pieces are very rare to hear in a concert setting. And then, of course, we have one of the most famous of his works in Waldstein, a sonata at the end of the evening. All of these pieces come from a time in Beethoven's life that we would identify as his high middle period. All of these pieces are published between the years of 1802 and 1806. Now note I said published. They weren't all written uh, during that time. Uh, the two short pieces I mentioned, number 19 and number 20, we think are written somewhere around 1797, so almost a decade earlier than the other works on this program. And that's really important to note because one of the extraordinary things in this body of work is that there's not a diminishment and how often can we say that about artists? I mean, sure, we have rock and roll bands that have been touring for 40 or 50 years. You know, Kiss and Rolling Stones come to mind. I think there's been some diminishment, though. Yeah. In, in Beethoven, uh, there isn't. That's not to say that some works might not be more enjoyable to you than, than another. You know, sure, you might prefer Moonlight Sonata to the Opus uh, 110 or Opus 111 that comes much later. Uh, that's just a matter of opinion, but they are no less great from one another. And that's what's extraordinary about this, is that over the course of almost 30 years, Beethoven sustains quality. There aren't any duds in, in this group, right? Um, and that's, that's really amazing. But if we don't understand fully the context and the timing, we might think that, oh, Beethoven was phoning it in at this point in time, and that's not the case. It's important to understand when these things um, follow suit. And it does propose kind of an interesting uh, programming idea. I love the fact that we hear these two earlier efforts, these two efforts from 1797 of a different Beethoven right before we hear one of his really, truly highly regarded masterworks in the time. I think it's a wonderful uh, context in textures, in mood, and also just in examining uh, an artist's life. So, this high middle period, it's, you know, when, when last we talked uh, on Zoom with uh, some of you, 
uh, for uh, Vijay Ven Venkatesh, uh, we left off with the Pastoral Symphony, uh, or the Pastoral uh, Sonata, rather, in 1802, and we're really picking up right where we left off. I mentioned then, and I'll repeat now, that you know this was a really tragic time for Beethoven. Um, his, he's coming to terms with the fact that his deafness isn't going to get better. You know, there's no magic panacea that he can take. There's no penance that he can do that's going to lift this from him. Um, the, the deafness is very real, and it's getting worse. And so no longer is he going to be able to sustain himself as a performing artist, which was very, very important to someone who grew up of relatively meager middle-class means. Um, you know, he really wanted, needed to have success as a performer to be able to survive, to be able to eat, to be able to drink, and I staff paper and, and all those things. You know, that, that was important. Um, composition wasn't necessarily going to, to pay out for him early in his career. So this deafness is a very, um, obviously a difficult thing for anybody to come to terms with, but Beethoven struggles also just with the, the idea behind it, that here is the sense that in him should be most elevated, and it's diminished. It's diminished. And so he really struggles with it. He writes this famous treatise. He contemplates suicide, you know, and um, ultimately doesn't take his own life, but instead recommits himself, and he commits himself to composition in, in a new way. So this is where we're kind of picking up with him. So his deafness is getting worse. He starts to get anxious about other ailments as well. Uh, some imagined, some not imagined. He was not in good health by any uh, uh, stretch of the imagination. Uh, he becomes even gloomier. He becomes more paranoid. And as I think we've talked a lot about uh, before, you know, interpersonal relationships for Beethoven uh, were not his forte either. He was known to be very caustic, very moody. Uh, it was extremely hard to be Beethoven's friend, and it was probably even more difficult to be his family member. And so that's where he is when he picks up this body of work. So what is going well for him? Well, the one, maybe the two things that are going well for him is that he has managed, with 10 years of success, 10 plus years of success, uh, to gain some financial stability. He's by no means wealthy, but he does have enough to you know, have a few of those little things that make life worth living sometimes. Uh, he's able to afford himself chocolate. He's able to afford himself nice coffee. I like a meringue, right? Uh, he's able to afford himself um, you know, a, a decent apartment and have a, a servant. So that, at least, is going better. And then his name, his reputation, has built up enough where now, all of a sudden, the name Beethoven has some cachet, and he can actually expect to make some money from his compositions. And that's key, because if he can't perform, that's the way that he can remain engaged uh, musically. So perhaps owing to some of these uh, difficulties, difficulties with family members, um, and, uh, you know, the ability to kind of cash in, that's the reason that we have the Sonata 19 and the Sonata 20 that we'll hear on this program, the part of the Opus 49 collection. Uh, we think they were written around 1797, and they're very short. I mean, just two movements each. There's no, um, there's probably no way that Beethoven ever intended for these to be published. Uh, part of our clue to that is that uh, there are some themes that are borrowed. Beethoven wasn't one of those composers like Vivaldi or Bach who borrowed from himself very often. Uh, but there is a septet that actually includes some of this music. Um, so that's one clue that perhaps Beethoven didn't expect that this would ever see the public. Um, the other is just kind of the simplicity. You know, each of them are in two movements. They make a very nice pairing together. Uh, the first is in G minor, the second is in G major. Um, and they, they have this kind of lively 
quality to them that I, I think you'll really, really enjoy. But where they were somewhat, you know, where they, they solved a need that perhaps nobody thought existed at that time is that they're pretty simple. They were included and published, you know, with the title, Two Simple Pieces or Two Simple Sonatas. And again, the simplicity doesn't diminish them in, in any way. It's still Beethoven. And apparently there was a thirst for that. Well, Beethoven wasn't the one who published these. Remember when I talked about it, it was difficult to be his family member. Um, one of his brothers saw an opportunity to make a little money, we think, and went ahead and published these works without consulting uh, Beethoven about it. And there was such a thirst for having something with Beethoven's name on it that was you know, graspable by an amateur Four different, uh, yeah, four different cities and three different publishers all put out editions of that music within the same year. So simple, but important. And you know, they they serve this function. They show what um, Beethoven was capable of, and some maybe some of the ideas that he was afraid to put forth publicly uh, in 1797, but were okay you know, by the time we cross over into the early 19th century. Uh, we then begin this evening with uh, the Opus 31 set. So these are the sonatas 16, 17, and 18. Here again, the chronology is a little bit misleading because actually um, the first um, was preceded by the second in terms of uh, composition. Now, these works were actually written on a commission, and, you know, Beethoven negotiated a fee. Uh, he set to work, he honored the commission, which he didn't always do. And, um, you know, we, we think that he was maybe a little bit distracted by some other things, but uh, the, um, it, it moves on that, that these works, you know, go to uh, this publisher who's based in Zurich. Well, two of them are published right away. Number 16 and 17 are published right away. But nobody ever sends Beethoven a proof. Now, this is standard practice even today, where you know if a major composer or a major writer is about to put something forth in the public, you let them see it one last time. When I produce an album, I guarantee you we listen one last time before it actually goes to the press, you know, before, you know, whether it's going to Axos or Sony or MarkTravis.com. Um, we, you know, take that extra step to make sure that everybody has checked the boxes. Well, sometimes mistakes still happen. In the case of these two, Beethoven was appalled when he looks at the scores. We think there were somewhere on the order of 80 mistakes just in those first two. So he says nuts to this and, you know, talks to his brother and says, we have to put out a new edition. And so he pursues that and puts out a new edition uh, with some corrections. But to this day, in 2022, we're still not sure if we've caught every mistake. We think that some mistakes from the first edition maybe survived. And we think that maybe new mistakes were made in trying to correct those editions. Um, so we're not really sure, and we don't have any autograph copies of, of these scores. So, you know, it's, um, you know, is the spirit of Beethoven present? Of course it is. Are we positive that every E flat isn't supposed to be any natural? Well, maybe not, you know, but, uh, but it is a terrific uh, body of music. And I, I think that you'll find that each of these three pieces, this amount of 16, 17, 18, really has an individual character. Uh, the great Beethoven scholar Charles Rosen even identifies just how much we garner just listening to the first movement. I don't recommend that all the time, but you know, if we compare the three movements, uh, the three opening movements of, of these um, three sonatas, we really do get three very distinct um, colors and attitudes. One is humor, uh, one is lyricism, uh, one is uh, tragedy. And I think you'll be able to tell which, which is which as you're listening. But maybe not, because uh, when we talk about 16, 16 
uh, is, is you look through your program book and you have the rarity guide. I would actually personally put 16 a little bit more uh, as being a little more rare than, than indicated. It, you know, occasionally perform is probably about right. Um, now here's where chronology is important because if we're coming out of the world of the pastoral sonata, we've heard Moonlight Sonata, we have some expectations about what Beethoven's going to do next. And so as at first hearing, the sonata number 16 seems like maybe old Ludwig is actually phoning it in. Maybe he's lost some of his daring. Maybe it's, you know, he's just nostalgic because he's looking backwards. And what's actually present here, but is lost through no fault of anyone, is that it's supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to be humorous. But it's sort of this 25-minute inside joke, unfortunately. And, um, you know, where, where, you know, unless you went to music school, and maybe even if you did, you might not be in on the punchline. Because it's subtle. And it requires a lot of knowledge of the time and the tendencies of composition and, and some of the things that were happening in parallel disciplines at that time. You know, so for example, you know, some of the humor comes in the opening. You're going to notice it's a kind of tricky rhythmic figure, and it's meant to sound like a hiccup. And this was a great musical joke, but because the tonality is a little easy for us to, to process, you know, we, we don't necessarily hear it that way. And we've heard other musical jokes, you know, in 2022. And so um, that humor maybe is lost on us. Then we have the second movement that is so operatic, but it's operatic in the way, you know, in, in Beethoven's mind, it's Bugs Bunny being Brunhilde, right? It's Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd singing Kill the Wabbit. But it's lost on us because doesn't all opera sometimes sound a little overdone and a little, uh, you know, larger than life at times, and I say this as a singer. Um, so the humor is not necessarily something that we are going to pick up on, and it wasn't necessarily even something that people uh, were clued into during Beethoven's time, but now that we know about that, it's something that you can listen for, and, and it does have this, you know, really humorous touch where he's just poking a little bit of fun at the conventions of the sonata writing, the conventions of the burgeoning bel canto movement in, in opera. There's a lot of depth there. We move on to number 17. 17 has the distinction of being the only one of the 32 sonatas that's in the key of D minor. So that right there kind of sets it apart from its uh, brethren. Now this piece is often published with the nickname Tempest. Um, that could mean a few different things, of course. It could mean the storm, it could have uh, connotations with, with literature. There is a story that um, one of Beethoven's assistants, a man by the name of Schindler, not the Schindler who wrote the Ode to Joy, um, was trying to get inside Beethoven's head a little bit and understand his uh, psyche and figure out what made him tick. And so he apparently asks, you know, Master, what about, you know, what's at the heart of this piece? What's at the heart of this piano sonata number 17? And Beethoven is said to have replied, all you need to do is read Shakespeare's Tempest. And I have seen long lectures that have tried to assign characters you know, to various segments and sequences of measure numbers in the movie, you know, trying to go blow for blow how this piece you know, reflects Shakespeare's work. But the truth is, is that while it's a great story and I've been telling it for 30 years, it's probably not true. It's probably not true. That said, his assistant was kind of known for uh, a lot of less than decent behavior perhaps in reaction to his treatment uh, from his uh, uh, boss. And, um, you know, it, we've, we found evidence that he would write the wrong thing down, he would transcribe some of Beethoven's thoughts incorrectly, or editorialize 
he would attribute things um, to himself. So there's no real reason to think that um, there's any truth to there being a Shakespearean association with this work. That said, it kind of works, you know. So I mean, by all means, if, if you love Shakespeare's Tempest, that's a, that's a nice thought to have conjured up. The work is certainly full of drama. It's just not necessarily what Beethoven was thinking about when, when he wrote the piece. Number 18, uh, we often refer to as the hunt, and it's in the key of E flat major. E flat major is a really important key for Beethoven. He regards it as the most heroic key. And indeed, we think of some of his truly great works as being in the key of E flat major. Uh, Emperor Gamma Concerto comes to mind, and perhaps most significantly, the symphony number three, which will emerge right on the tail end of this high middle period. Um, these, these are works in this heroic key, and, and it, it's a, Beethoven never composes an E flat major without purpose. So, um, this is an interesting one, too, apart from the other sonatas, in that, in terms of formal structure, it's the only uh, one where three of, the, three of the four movements actually follow true sonata allegro, or allegro uh, structure, you know, which is what they're supposed to do, but Beethoven was an iconoclast, he, he did things differently. Um, and as a result, there's no real slow movement, you know, instead you get of little dance movements uh, that will, you know, give you some indication, you know, give you a little bit of a break from the, the rest of the action. Um, so then, at the end of this evening, you know, on the other side of the works that are written early, we have probably the most famous piece of the evening, and indeed one of the most famous works in, in the Beethoven piano canon, in the Waldstein Sonata. So this work is composed over the course of the years 1803, 1804. He's only working on a couple of other things at this time. He's working on finishing up uh, the, the Symphony Number no. 3, or the Erotica Symphony, and he is also working on his Leonora Overture Number no. 2. Now early on, you know, when Beethoven is um, thinking about the Opus 31 set, you know, Sonata 17, uh, I'm sorry, 16, 17, and 18, he's putting together one of the things that's on his mind is writing an opera, and that opera is Fedele, it's the only opera that he completed, and we could talk, well, I could talk for a long time about just all the problems of finding the right overture uh, for, for that. Um, he was occupied with that a lot uh, over the course of his lifetime. And so he was on the second iteration, you know, by the time this launch time uh, sonata comes about. Uh, the piece is named after one of Beethoven's patrons. Unfortunately, that was a patron who uh, lost his fortune. Uh, by the time the work is actually published, um, he was an advocate for Austria in a declaring war on Napoleon and um, really lost everything lost his wife's fortune as well as, as a result of it. So he's one of those that you know, dies penniless and in great disgrace. Uh, but for Beethoven, he was such a integral part of you know, so many of his early successes. And so um, you know, we still, that, that name remained on, on the piece. There was some thought about crossing it out at, at different points in time. Of course, Beethoven famously crosses out the dedication to Napoleon on his uh, Eroica Symphony, but doesn't um, alter the history in any way with the Waldstein Sonata. Uh, another interesting thing to think about with this piece, I mean, not only does it bring the piano sonata to kind of an all new level in terms of its intensity and in terms of its concert like. You know, that like this is a concert piece. This isn't a work for students. This is a, a concert work outright. It's not an exercise. Uh, this is a piece that's meant to be heard outside of the studio, outside of the salon. Um, this, this is, you know, like nothing else that was written at its time. Well, it also, you know, again, in talking about Beethoven's journey, uh, we've touched on the fact that technology 
also made some great strides, particularly the technology in um, cameras. And so Beethoven, at the time, you know, 1803, 1804, receives a new piano from this uh, famous maker, uh, Sebastian Ferro, uh, who's based in uh, Paris. And this new piano has five and a half octaves. Beethoven hated it. He didn't like the piano. But he seemingly was at least inspired by the possibilities that having more notes to work with did. So, you know, this is a piece where we actually see a stretch. We see four notes above what was standard at that time that he uses as, as part of this piece. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's reflective of where Beethoven was in terms of his compositional development. It's also reflective of, you know, the technology that was available to him at the time. And that he was able to adapt, that he was able to embrace that, move forward, even if he didn't particularly care for the instrument. I mean, at this point, he's pretty deaf. So, you know, what issues he had, I don't know. You know, I'm sure there might be some accounts. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to think about that, you know, here's, here's this first. You know, that all of a sudden this expanded range is available and Beethoven ever the revolutionary is right there. You know, so it's one of those ways, you know, as I said, he, he embraces, he comes to terms with the fact that he's going deaf, right? He doesn't like it, you know, he laments it. Um, but maybe, just maybe, it opens some new possibilities for him. You know, now, that he does have an established name, now that he does have a cachet, you know, that the name Beethoven means something to people, maybe just maybe he can take some of the risks that he couldn't take as a youth. And then with the deafness, maybe it frees him up in a way to just explore some things that he wouldn't otherwise explore, you know, wouldn't otherwise think that he could get away. With exploring, you know, so it's it's a way of he he perseveres, and and we are the ones who benefit from from his perseverance as he you know continues. A lot of people would have given up, but he continues in his pursuit. Uh, the the first three sonatas that you'll hear are also the last that are published as a group. So. Um, you know, Opus 49 collection, which we discussed written earlier, they're published as a set. Opus 31, 16, 17, and 18, they're published together. All China is all on its own. And so is the case with all the sonatas that come next. And so that too, I think, gives us just some hints as to what Adrian thinks of these works at this point in time and what, um, what they meant to him, what he intends them to mean to us, their significance, their strength, all of those things. So we're in for a real treat tonight with uh, two wonderful young artists. Uh, we're going to split the program and give us an evening of six major than sonatas. Again, two of them are really short. Um, but uh, what, a, what a wonderful chance to kind of go through this journey. You know, Beethoven's high middle period doesn't extend much beyond this. Probably includes the 20, Second sonata probably also includes the Apostolonata sonata, and then, you know, he moves on to the next phase, and uh, we move on to the next phase of, of enjoying it. So thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I can't wait to hear what our artists do with this. I'm very happy to answer some questions.